Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello. 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 There's like half as many of you as there were last time I was here. Did Jashank scare them off? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not as loud as him as you've noticed, so maybe, maybe they'll come back. But yes, hello and welcome back after the break, and welcome back to having me in a lecture after the break. I hope you've had a good break. Um, I will look at that in a second. So, one, one big thing, the assignment was due yesterday. How many of you like did the assignment and handed it in yesterday? Before sort of midnight-ish? Okay, it's a, a couple of you. Um, something really important to note, a couple of things, shh, a couple of things. First of all, for many of you, it's like the, the first big piece of code you've written. So even if it doesn't work completely perfectly, like the fact that you have done anything is fantastic. So a genuine well done for me. Um, the second thing is if you haven't handed it in yet, you should still hand it in. The late penalty is 2% of the maximum mark you can achieve per hour. So if it's 24 hours late, that's 48. You can still get 50% if you hand it in tonight at midnight. What's up? Okay. So I very much recommend, if you haven't done the assignment, if you haven't handed it in, please hand it in. You'll still get marks. It'll be great. Shh. Okay, that's the forward button, not the back button. So looking at the stuff for today's lecture. If you guys want to talk, I can go home. So otherwise, I will be here and you can go home. Either way, in here, I talk, you listen. At home, you talk. Cool. So after this lecture, we're going to be talking about I slash O, which will make a lot more sense in a minute. Um, looking at reading and writing fire was using that. We'll look some more at arg C and arg V. And we'll look some more at memory in C. So that will be fun. Um, admin number one, don't panic. How many of you are panicking a bit at the moment? It's week six of uni and you've got a lot of stuff to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. It's, it's a pretty stressful, like semester just sort of ramps up and ramps up and ramps up, right? And you've got stuff due in your other courses and stuff due in this course, although assignment's done, yay. But just stick with it. The fact that the remaining, what, two thirds of you who are still here have made it through, you're doing a pretty good job. And to those of you who are watching the video and aren't here in person because you're worried it'll be Jashank, it's okay, I'm here. My rainbow hair is here, it's beautiful. Was Jashank okay though? Was he nice to you? Yeah, did he yell at you really loudly and your ears hurt? Yes. Yeah. Oh well. Um, so the week five weekly test is due on Thursday. It was due today. And then one of my students was like, can we get the due date extended? And I was like, I'll ask Andrew Taylor. And he said, yes. So there you go. Thank you, student in my class. You know who you are. Lab marks have been released. If, shh, if you think there's like a bigger picture problem with the lab marking, like, oh, this auto test is completely broken, post in the forum. If there's a problem with your mark, talk to your tutor. Go to help sessions. Cool, so looking at a new topic, I slash O, which stands for input slash output. Um, and so there are lots of ways that a program can take in input and give output. And it's really important that it can do that, right? Because if a program can't have any input or any output, then it'll always do the same thing. Just kind of boring. And you've already seen a couple of ways we can do this. Um, things like printf and scanf, get char and put char, f gets, f puts. And these all work with what we call standard in and standard out, or standard input and standard output, so like std in and std out. So std in is things like scanf, get char, f gets. std out is things like printf and put char. Um, and those go to your terminal. So when you see things on your terminal, when you type things into your terminal, that goes to std in. And when things print out to your terminal, that goes to std out. Um, but there are also some other options. We have a thing called std er or standard error. So this is what you'd use if there are errors you want to talk about. So like if there's an error in your program, you might print to std er so that they know it's an error. And we can also use files. So you could make a file called input.txt and read from that, for example. Am I talking too quickly? Yes, OK. I'm out of practice at talking slowly. I haven't looked at my talk slowly sign in a while. 
So um, standard error st uh, it still goes to the terminal. Um, and so you can't distinguish it if you just run your program. Like, you can't tell the difference. But it's what we'd call semantically different. And what this means is, even though it might look the same, the meaning behind it is different. Um, that's sort of similar to like the hash defines, right? If you have hash define town Adelaide zero, syntactically, zero will mean town Adelaide. But semantically, what does zero mean? Zero doesn't mean Adelaide inherently, right? There's no inherent link between that, so we'd say that it's semantically wrong. Um, it's used to print errors, and you can redirect it separately to standard out. So you can make standard out go somewhere and standard error go somewhere else. Um, and we can use f printf to print to this. f printf being printf to a file. Studio is kind of a file. So instead of printf, something has gone wrong. f printf studio in front, something has gone wrong. Um, so it's just like printf, but it works with files. It might be a bit confused. Stood out and stood out aren't really files. Like it's not like you've got a file standard out .txt, um, but it's what we call a file descriptor, and this means it works similarly to a file in terms of how your program reacts with it. That's really what you need to know. So stood out kind of looks like a fire. File doesn't look like a fire. I hope. Uh, it's a file descriptor. Looks kind of like a file. Stood out also looks kind of like a file. So whenever we accept expects a file, we can give it std out or std instead. Um, and we can also work with actual real files. Ignore this slash. My slide making thing was being grumpy. So file star output file equals f open, open a file, called output.txt to write to it. We'll look at that more in a minute. And then f printf to this output file saying hello. Um, and so we can work with the actual files. We can print things to files, just like we do printf. We can scan it, scan from files, just like we do scanf. Hello. Hello. You're late. It's okay. He's a tutor. Um, and we saw this in text just before for scanning files in C. Being a tutor means you can be late to anything, right? And if you're a lecturer, you can be even more late to anything. It's great. Class doesn't start until you're there. I don't recommend that. I try very hard to be early. I tried very hard. Um, we saw the syntax just before to open an, a file called output.txt in writing mode so that we can write to it. We would say file star with no slash, output file equals f open output.txt w. And then to print hello to that, f printf to this file, which is the thing we've just made here called output file, with the words hello. Let me check where I'm to with my slides. Cool. So does this make sense so far? Does this sort of make sense and you're confused because you haven't seen code? Or are you confused more than just that? OK, we'll look at some code in a minute. And hopefully, it'll be less confusing. Um, so there's another way we can do files. Am I talking too fast again? There's. File redirection talks slowly. Doesn't make sense. Uh, we can also do files by having the terminal do it for us. So we can use normal printfs, compile it normally, run it normally, but then we have this greater than sign, the one that goes this way for you. And that means put the output from standard out into this file called output.txt. Um, so we just printf completely normally and the terminal handles for us, putting it into output.txt. And then if we do a thing called cat, output.txt, cat will print a file, super useful. Hello from a normal printf. OK, let's do some code. Doo -doo -doo. Not that one, this one. Uh, I can totally do this thing right. No, okay. How do I make a symlink to my folder? Computers are hard. My apologies. We go six slash live. No, Wednesday live. 
code. Cool, I did the thing. Uh, what's the umask I said? Zero, two, two. Okay, so let's first of all look at some file handling. So I said before we could do this, and to prove it, I'll put it into some code. So what do, I need, what do I need at the start of my file? A description, what's the description? It does something with files, very good. Andrew Bennett. I think it's that date. Okay, hash include stidio.h. What does stidio stand for? Standard input and output, yeah, you learned that today. I'll just call it that. Do you remember what this argc argv thing means here? Did I ever teach you about that? I think I did. I hope I did. Um. Cool. So. What I've said we can do here, file star without the slash because my thing was being mean, output file equals if open output.txt w to write, and then print out hello to the file. So I am hoping that what this will do, it'll make a file called output.txt and then put the words hello, the word hello into it. And I will see if it does. You might have seen Jishank also struggling to use the mouse. It's because we don't use the mouse when we have our own Linuxes. Come on. Cool. I did it. I did it. Uh, DCC dash O F printf. F printf dot C dot slash R. And to prove it to you, the only files here are F printf the program and F printf dot C. I've run the program and output.txt has appeared. How awesome is that? Do you remember how I said we can print files out in the terminal before? Give you a clue, it's an animal and it's not a dog. Catch, yes. Cool, and if we print out the output of output.txt, we get hello. Um, and I'll open it in gedit just to prove to you. It says hello. Cool, is that exciting? That's so exciting, we can print out the word hello into a file, so good. I'm sorry, computers are really hard. Um, so now I will make one that's just called printf. Get rid of this stuff. I'll just do a normal printf. Hello again. Okay, so I've made this thing called printf. Hopefully you remember this from lecture zero. It'll just do a normal printf. Cool, prints out hello again. So you might remember from a moment ago, I said we can use these, these arrows to make actually go into files rather than just call patterns. So do you remember how I said we did that before? You're making a, a this way symbol, that way. Cool, so if we say fprintf into some file.txt, you can see like the arrow means, you know, put it into this file, so it's easy to remember. And now if I cut some file.txt, hello again. Cool, um, we can do the same thing with scanf. scanf.c um, int number equals zero. 
Cool. So again, program from week one. Scan a number in, print a number out. Scan f, scan f dot c. So normal program, type in a number five, the number was five. Cool. But what if I made a file that had five in it and then put that into the program instead? There's this really cool thing you can do with cat. You can take cat and you can redirect its output to a file. Cool. And now I have a file called five, it contains a five. And so now if I run my scanf taking in the file five.txt, it says the number is five. So it's got the normal scanf, but rather than me typing something, it's taken that from the file and scanned it in. Is this all good so far? Yes. Very good question. Why is it different? You didn't explain that. So the, the, this way pointing one, pointing like this, goes into this file. Um, the opposite pointing one, pointing into scanf, takes it from this file. Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't know the names of them because like, it's, this one's also greater than because this is greater than that. Um, but I do know this one goes out and this one goes in. Cool, but why might this be useful? Like, cool, look, we can scan in the number five from file. That's super exciting. Yay, Andrew, you've shown us an amazing thing. Going to use this forever. <coughs> Did we do any interesting things at any point with like f gets okay so let's just steal this code of shanks week six Wednesday live Cool, so let's make this. It takes an array, scans in a thing, puts it into the array, and then it prints out the array. Uh, if gets stolen. Cool, enter some text, hello, prints out hello. Um, again, this is boring, I haven't shown you anything cool. Let's do while true. Get some stuff printed out again. Um, is there any reason this might go wrong? Or I might regret my life choices? No, you're all pretty happy with what I'm doing. You think I'm not making any mistakes with my life? That's nice. Okay, so it's just typing whatever I give it, that's cool. The end of file doesn't stop it. Normally when you type control D, right, you want it to go, oh, it's hit the end of file, stop doing this thing. Can we do that with fgets? I think fgets returns null when it's finished. Does anybody know? Does anybody know how I can find out? Um, there are these great things called man pages, which I'm going to show you in a minute anyway. Uh, you type the word man for like manual, and then followed by the thing that you're confused about, fgets. So this will tell you, cool, this is how fgets works. Do -do -do, fgets, do -do -do, reads in at most one lesson size, blah, 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 doesn't tell me what it returns. F gets return S on success and null on error or when end of file occurs while no characters have been read. I'm good with that. So if this is going to return null when it's finished, how can I change my code to make it stop when this happens? If it does this, if it returns null, I want to stop. I want to go, okay, code's over. I've hit the end of my file. Yes, someone said move that into the while loop condition. Very good. So this is one way you could do it. While f gets into our array equals null. Not quite. Does not equal null. 
never do get. Maybe we'll see why in a minute. Um, so while our fgets function does not equal null, print out the array. Is this confusing? Who is confused by the fact that I have an fgets in a loop statement? Okay, a couple of you. Do you have questions or are you just confused and don't know what your questions are? Just confused. Okay, so we can do anything we like inside a while loop condition. This is just like another place that we can write code. And how the while loop works is it evaluates the code in here, it runs the code in here, and then it sees what it evaluates to basically, whether it's true or false. So I could put this up here. If this thing here, maybe I'll actually say int answer equals this. Chuck that in here. Didn't I literally just call that in answer? Cool. So what this will do, this will make me a variable called answer. It will make it be equal to f gets blah, 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 does not equal null. And so what this will do, this will evaluate this expression. If it's true, it'll be one. If it's false, it'll be zero. So then answer will be either equal to one or zero, depending on whether it was true or false. And so if I print this here out, it'll either print out one if it's reached the end of the thing, or zero if it hasn't reached the end of the thing. Does that make sense? Are you still thoroughly confused or a little bit less confused? A little bit less confused? Nobody's nodding. Maybe this will help. If it gets stolen. So enter some text. Hello. Hello, it's going to print out whatever. Ah, answer is one. I type in some more stuff, answer is one. So we can see what this is doing here. When it runs this if gets here, it goes, does this thing here not equal null? If this thing does not equal null, it'll be one, which is what it's printing out, one. Um, if it did equal null, it would print out zero. So I hit control D to say like we're at the end of the file, and it's printed out zero. Does that make more sense? Still confused? Still confused? Okay. Is there any way I can unconfuse you? Which part is confusing? Say that again. Cool, good question. So if gets scan something in from a file, and rem remember we said before standard in is sort of like a file, and so something like if gets will happily go standard in as a file, I'm gonna take it from this file. Does that answer your question? I'm seeing this look of, ah, oh, I understand on your face. Cool, are there any other questions? Any other confusions? Yes. Uh, can you explain what's actually happening in this program again? Yes, I can. Um, so we'll make this be while whatever, while one. Great way to do it. We have our array. So we have an array of size, array size, and it exists in this function. Um, we then do our fgets. I'll put this up to start here. So what this is gonna do, this is gonna do the fgets, so read from standard in a maximum of array size things into the thing array. It's gonna do this thing and then it's also gonna check this condition here, is this equal to null? Or is this not equal to null? If it is not equal to null, then it will put one in here, true. And if it is equal to null, it'll put zero in there, which is false. Get rid of that gets. Um, and then after that, it prints out the array. So print f percent s, print out the string that is inside our array called array. Uh, and I'll put the answer down there. So this will print out whether this was true or false. Does that make more sense? Maybe? Yes. Um, so do I have to type in control D to end the file? Yes, I do. 
um, or if you hit the actual end of the actual file, which is what I was going to do next. Um, so shall I run this again? So it prints out into some text. Cool. Oh, good. I'm going to type in hello. It's gone. Here is the array. It's made an array. In answer equals do this f gets, which it's done. It's scanned in the hello into the array. It's then computed this equation of was this thing here equal to null? So if it was not equal to null, then make it true, otherwise false. That's been stored in answer. It's gone print f out the actual array, which contains hello. Then it's printed out answer is percent d. Because it was true, it's one. Does that make more sense? Because it was not because it did not return null, because it was not the end of the file, it's true. So it returned one. So if I type some more, it's all good. And if I type the end of the file character, control D, it's saying that it is the end of the file, so it's returning zero. But that's not actually stopping our loop. We want to make it stop our loop somehow. So with loops, one is true and zero is false. So if I made my loop be while zero, it's not going to run because it's always going to be false. So let's do that. Run the thing. Into some text and it's just finished because this loop doesn't happen. While zero, it's never true, so it just stops. Then hits the end and does return zero. Um, and so this is why if I put this into the while loop condition, it's going to evaluate this thing here. If it's true, if it's not equal to null, then it will keep going. It'll be one. If it's false, uh, if it is equal to null, it'll be set to zero, which is false, and the while loop will stop. Does that make more sense? Yes? Someone say yes? Yes? Cool. Uh, what? Ah, printing out answer when answer doesn't exist. So the error I got here was error use of undeclared identifier answer. Answer didn't exist. I deleted the variable answer. Can't print it out if it doesn't exist. And you should save the file. Cool, f gets stolen. That's some text. Hello, hello. Blah, 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 blah. Then if I type control D for end of file, it stops. F gets will return null because it's hit the end of file. The is it not null will be false because null, null not null is false because null is equal to null, and then it will stop. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. Who is not who is sort of not confused, sort of happy? Okay, a couple of you. Who is extremely confused? Okay, it's about half on half. Let's keep going. If you have any I'm confused questions that I can explain to help you, then let me know during the break. Um, but the thing I wanted to show you was instead of typing in all of this stuff here, right? what I could do is I could put it into a file and then have it run on that file. Um, so let's go to like Wikipedia. What's someone's favorite Wikipedia article? Sure, Uniform Resource Locator. Cool, so I've put a whole bunch of text into this file from Wikipedia saying this is what it does. Do you remember how I can put input into my program from the terminal, from a file, and go away? What thing do I type? Yes. But it's the opposite direction for me. You've got to draw it backwards so I can see it the following way. It's confusing, isn't it? Um, URL.txt. And we can see it's printed out the stuff that was in that file. I'll do that again, just for fun. So it's gone into some text. It's printed that out. And then it's done the printf of the array with all the stuff in it that we've scanned in. Cool. Does that kind of make sense? Kind of makes sense. One person is nodding. It's good enough for me. Um, uh, F8. 
full screen, go away. So, oh, did I not actually talk about this yet? I thought I talked about this. I went back to get the thing. Cool, so another cool thing, um, hash includes string.h has a lot of cool functions. Have any of you seen any functions from string.h yet? Have I shown you any? Tudor raises his hand, that doesn't count. Um, okay, so I'll show you some stuff from string.h. First of all, I said before, man pages exist and they are awesome, and this is true, and they're also scary, which is also true. Can I like full screen in my terminal? Yeah, okay. So if I want to know about something, I type man for manual, and in this case, let's man string. So like for string.h, I type in string. And the three means C programming. So I run this, and it says in string.h, this one here, here are all of, the pro all of the functions you can run. Look at all those functions. So not that button, this one here. So it says string.h contains stir copy, stup, stup copy. Um, stir cat, stir chur, stir comp, stir colon, stir copy, um, all of these various functions. And if you want to know what one of them does, you can then man that one. So let's look at stir len. Stir len, cool. So if we want to find out more about this function stir len, man three stir len, cool. And then this will tell us what it does. So it calculates the length of a string. Cool, useful thing to be able to do. Uh, in more depth, calculates the length of the string s, excluding the terminating null byte, and returns the number of bytes in the string s. Um, and so have a look through those. Have a read through them. See if there are any that are interesting to you. Um, shh. But keep in mind, many of these you can write yourself. Like, could you write a function to find the length of a string? How would you go about doing that? Any ideas? I have a string. Let's say that, so first of all, what is a string? What's the difference between a string and a character array? Did someone say you can't hear me? It has a slash zero. Oh, a slash zero, I guess a null terminator on the end. Very good. So a string is a character array with a null terminator on the end, which is that backslash zero thing. Um, so if you know that a string has a null terminator at the end, how can you find out how long it is? If I told you my string was like A, B, C, D, E, F, null terminator, how long is the string? It's six, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, null terminator, so I stop. So how could you write a program to do this? What would your program need to do? Yeah, count through them, add up how many there until it gets to a null terminator. So like loop through, is this a null terminator? No, count is now one. Is this null? No, count is now two. Count is three, four, five, six. Oh, it's now a null terminator, stop counting. Still in the six. Um, and so that sort of thing, I recommend trying to write yourself a practice. Um, the more complicated ones, I do not recommend trying to write yourself a practice unless you are feeling really bored and really enthusiastic. Um, so, Let's take a break. I have this fantastic video. Um, Soon or late. There's this great guy called Tom Scott, and he wears red t-shirts. And he has this really good video about the problem with time and time zones. And I'm going to play it, and we can all sort of die on the inside in sympathy with each other. Um, but feel free to go get a drink, whatever you normally do during a break. Otherwise, watch this exciting video. Soon or later, every program has to deal with time zones. And I can't really offer much advice here. I can offer a cautionary tale. Um, I can tell you why you really should never, ever deal with time zones. Oops. Let's imagine that someone has, has built an application that lets you calculate how many seconds something is in the past. You type in a date and time, it gives you a number of seconds. And they, they look at that, okay, that, that kind of works for me. But let's, let's add a little box that lets you change the time zone. So if you're, you know, if you're comparing between now in New York and five days ago in London, you can work that in. And that's fine. You know, the, the little drop down lets you change which hour forward or backward of Greenwich you are. Brilliant. 
Sooner or later, after it gets a bit popular, they'll get a call from Australia. And Australia will say, good day, I'm not going to try and do accents. Um, I just shouldn't do accents. Um, Australia will say, hello. Um, by the way, we're nine and a half oh, hours ahead yeah. of Greenwich. Sorry, yes. And the programme will go, really? Yeah, 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 nine and a half hours. Can you try it in about 30 oh, okay, seconds? Okay, I'll put the special and it's still not broken. And a little bit later, someone will call from Nepal, okay. and they'll say, hello, um, we're five and a quarter hours ahead of Greenwich. And they'll say, really? Say, yeah, yeah, we've been that for ages. Yeah, five and a quarter hours. Great, okay. And they'll, and they'll put in a special case, and maybe they'll look up the list of time zones, the, the canonical list that tells you what everything is, and they'll make sure they've covered every time zone in the world. And then autumn will come along, and we'll get a call from England, and uh, England will say, excuse me, um, we're an hour out at the minute, what's going on? And they'll go, hold on, the clock's just changed. That's fine, no, no, we dealt with that. We dealt with it, we, we made a note of when daylight saving changes for us, and we put that in. And, and England will say, no, see, daylight saving changed a week earlier for us, it's different depending on where you live. We, we shift our clocks back a week before you. And, and at that point, at that point, generally the program will start to hold their head in their hands and realise what they've got themselves into. And that's fine. You know, they'll, they'll put that in and they will deal with each country shifting to daylight savings time on a different day. And they'll look at the file that tells them how to do that and they'll copy all that in. And then they'll get a call from someone in the Southern Hemisphere again who will say, yeah, we're not shifting back in the autumn, we shift forward. Our, our spring is in November. And then they'll get a call from Samoa, uh, out in the Pacific on the international date line. And Samoa will say, hello, um, yeah, we, we skipped today the other year. And the programme will say, what? <laughs> yeah, we skipped today. We went from December the 29th, 2011, to December the 31st. We, we shifted from one side of the international date line from being hours and hours behind Greenwich to being hours and hours ahead of Greenwich. It helps us with trading with Australia. Can, can you take account of that when you work out how many days things are and how many seconds things are in the past? It's, it's fine. There's a, there's a file that tells you when any country has changed its time zone. And it turns out that that happens fairly often. But they're, they're announced ahead of schedule. So as long as you keep that file updated and code that into your program's logic as well, it'll be fine. Then you look back and you notice that during World War II, England had double British summer time. It went completely onto BST and then just added an extra hour. So it was two hours ahead of Greenwich, despite having Greenwich. It's fine you deal with that. Change, we notice I'm starting talking as if, as if it was you or me, because I've done this before and it's really, really frustrating. Can you make sure that you subscribe to the list of when countries are going to change their time zones, which happens, apparently, many times. Like, sometimes, several times in a year, because governments change over. And then, then the programme, this, this mythical programme, gets called from Libya, who in 2013, with only a couple of days' notice, decided that they weren't going to put the clocks back. With enough notice that it wasn't possible for anyone to get the update out in time, and meaning that every Libyan computer, no matter what operating system it ran, was an hour out. It's okay, you, you read the news article about that, you hurriedly code that in as well. And then, then you get a call from the West Bank, where the Israeli population is on a different time zone to the Palestinian population, because one is following Israel and one isn't. And now you have two populations of people in the same location who are following different time zones. And now they're all having to ask themselves whether they're on this time zone or, or this one, depending on who they are and where they are. And there's no way to code that into your program. And then, then you get a call from the historian who says, right, I'm trying to calculate some, some times back in the 18th century. And we changed from the Julian calendar to the, to the Gregorian calendar. And it's not that we lost about three weeks. It's just that we skipped right from this date to this date and, and missed the others. And can you code it so that, so that it just kind of works that out for me? And it's fine because someone else has already told you when those dates are and, and you can code that into your program's logic as well, but now it's looking really long and really complicated. It's a tangled mess of spaghetti code that somehow works out. And then you get a call from the Russian historian who says, yeah, 
we only changed the Gregorian calendar in the 20th century. And it turns out that the dates that you skip change depend on, depending on your location. And, and can you deal with that as well? And then you get a call from the British historian who says that until I think it was the 16th century, the year started on the 25th of March. Just to blow your mind there, on, on the 24th of March, 924, and then it will be the 25th of March, 925, and that is the next day, because you have gone from December 31st, 924, to January the 1st, 924, because it goes in that order and it's massively complicated. And then you get the call from the astrophysicist, who says, by the way, we just had a leap second. And at this point, you just kind of go, what? Leap second. Because the Earth does not rotate at a constant speed. It slows down, it speeds up as, as tectonic plates move about and, and magnetic fields shift or something like that. And so occasionally, the International Astronomical Union will work out whether we need a leap second. And if you do, the clocks go 23, 59, 58, and then it's 23, 59, 59, and then instead, instead of going like any sensible time zone would, it goes 23, 59, 60, and everything breaks because suddenly you have 61 seconds in a minute. So depending on your implementation, either your clock gets one second out of sync with the rest of the world, or it repeats a second. The way you're meant to deal with this is something called the Unix timestamp. A number file, I think, has talked about this before, that, that you have this number that started at the first exact second of 1970, and increments, one second per second, constantly, tick, tick, tick. And that's great, because what you're meant to do is you take whatever, whatever data has been given you, and you calculate that as a unique timestamp, and you put that into your database. And, and that'll just deal with leap seconds, except it doesn't, of course it doesn't. Because, because you have universal coordinated time, which, which includes leap seconds. And that it repeats occasionally, and it just includes 23, 59, 60. And then you have astronomical time, which does not include leap seconds, and has steadily been getting out of sync with the rest of the world, because we need to look at the stars and design telescopes around it. And what you learn, what you learn after, after dealing with time zones, is that what you do is you put away your code. You don't try and write anything to deal with this. You look at the people who have been there before you. You look at the first people, the people who have dealt with this before, the people who have built the spaghetti code. And you go to them and you thank them very much for making it open source. You give them credit. You take what they have made, you put it in your program, and you never ever look at it again. Because that way lies madness. Google actually has a really, really good approach to leap seconds. They invented themselves. There's an article about it on, on their blog, I think, that, that explains it. They do something called a leap smear. Um, because having 61 seconds in a minute, or because having a clock tick back a second, uh, can be really, really bad for, for massive agencies that sort of have to synchronize everything really precisely and have to trust uh, that one bit of data was stored before another. They, essentially smear the second out over the whole day. They increase their clock by a microsecond at a time. Tick, 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 all the way through the day. So that it's sometimes maybe even half a second out from reality. But as long as everything on their service is half a second out, it's built to be out of sync with the world, um, as long as it knows that one thing happened before another. Like having continuity is more important than actually having accurate time. Okay, microphone working? Cool, microphone working. So I can tell you the good news, there are no leap seconds in 2018. Very good, and I guess also you should feel sort of happy that you had to do just Australia and New Zealand and just 14 in total towns because just in 2018, otherwise, uh, you know, we, we, we don't want to like break your minds before you even get past the end of first semester. So hello, welcome back, did you have a good break? Did anybody actually leave, or did you just watch the video? You can't have another break. Oh, no, you can have a two-minute break. There we go. We'll start back at exactly three o'clock. So have two minutes. Do actually stand up this time. 
Hello again. I hope you enjoyed your two plus three free minutes break. Shh. Oh, look, you guys were quiet quickly. Clearly, you're the good students, and the bad students have all left because I told them to go home if they're going to talk. So, I've had quite a few people tell me that they are very confused by FGETs and all of this file stuff, and I will do another example of that. Uh, um, okay, so I'm going to do a file with this. Um, so we have this thing. If we want to open a file, so like if we want to open a file called output.txt, for example, and we want to write things into that file, there are sort of two steps we need to do, or to print to it, there are two steps. The first step is to basically open it. So to tell the C program, hey, here's the file. Please open this file for me and like store it in this variable. So this variable here called output file will allow you to refer back to that output.txt. So that's sort of like step one. And then step two is to actually use fprintf or something with an f in it to print to the output file. Yes. Cool. So what does this W inside here mean? That means it's in like writing mode. So you can write something to the file. Um, the other options you have include R for reading to the file. So just get input. You can't write output to it. And A for appending to the file. So write something again and again and again. If you have write, it'll delete the file if it exists and then make a new one. If you have A, it'll add to an existing file. Cool. Good question. Um, so step one is to open the file. Um, I'll write those there. W equals like overwrite. Cool. And then step two is to actually write to the file somehow. So we can't just in one line say, hey, printf to output.txt. We've got to first of all tell it, hey, please open output.txt and put it into this thing that I can use to talk about it. And then f printf, hey, please put that into this thing here called output file. Um, but we can give f printf any sort of file ish thing that we want. So we could give it standard out. And so what this will do, this will print to standard out saying hello. This is exactly the same hello as this here. Like there is absolutely no difference between these two lines. This one here will print hello to stand it out. And this one here will print hello to stand it out. Um, we can print something to standard error or standard error by saying like that. How something is broken. What? I said save, not delete. Cool. And so printing this will print it to standard error, which semantically means, which to the person using it means something is broken, like it's an error, you should deal with it separately to dealing with normal output. Um, stood out. OK, does that make sense? Are there any questions about this? Yes. What do you mean by where do you access? As in where do they go? Yeah. So they go to the terminal. So whenever you printf something normally like this, goes to the terminal, or wherever it goes to, like if you use the arrow to send it to a file, it'd go to a file. But it goes to st std out, and then the terminal could move it somewhere else, for example. And so fprintf std out hello is the exact same thing. Prints to the terminal. Make sense? Cool. Any more questions? OK. Um, right, so let's also look at uh, f gets. Um, 
So we can also f get, see where we've got std in here, that's saying we want to get something from standard in. We can put any file in here that we can read things from and get it from that file instead. So man 3 f gets tell us that this is how f gets works. So char star s in size file star stream. Cool, that clearly makes total amount of sense to everybody. That was sarcasm, by the way. So this is what the prototype for f gets looks like. So when you call the function f gets, it returns a char star, it returns a string. It takes in a string. Right, it takes in a place to put it. Um, it has a size, which is the, the maximum size it will allow to go in there. And then it takes in a file star stream. So for example, this file we opened over here was a file star. And that just means it's a thing that can talk about a file. This one, yes, this one here. Cool. So let's do an f gets from a file. So I'll call it input file because I'm so original. Input file equals f open. What do I want to call my input file? Any suggestions? I'll just call it input. I don't have anything better to put it in there yet. Cool. And so now I can replace this line here with the same line, but using input file here. Basically, wherever we have a file star stream or std out, std out, std in, we can replace it with a file that we have opened ourselves. Cool. Does that make sense? So this will read from the contents of an actual file rather than from the terminal. Um, print out whatever it's written. So let's run that code and see if it's actually going to do that. I've forgotten something in here. I'm very good at forgetting things. Do you remember what I said before I have to have with my f open? Like the, the w or the r or something, right? So I will put an r here. I want to read from input.txt. I don't want to override it. I want to read the things that are in it. Do, 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 compile, cool. f gets file. I did something bad. I did something wrong, and now the computer is mad at me. Let's, let's run that again. So I've received an ASAN deadly signal, uh, runtime error, illegal array, point or other operations. So I've broken the C laws. I've done something illegal. The C police are going to come and arrest me. Hopefully not because I'm a lecturer. I'm safe. Um, but it's saying here um, something has gone wrong. Input file is equal to null. So in this case, I had, like the, the input file doesn't exist, right? Like it was, I told it to read from input.txt, but I don't have an input.txt. And so it's gone, I can't find it. Here, I read it into no file at all, and so it's gone, nah, you, you monster. Um, in terms of the syntax here, I'll zoom in again, catch uh, into input.txt. So I'll show you just normal cat first. Cat will repeat back whatever you type to it. So like, hello, hello. Andrew is awesome, you are awesome, everyone is awesome, close enough. So cat will just repeat back what you tell it, right? So if we do cat into input.txt, um, so what cat is doing here, it's reading from std in, me typing, and it's printing the std out, the terminal. If I do cat into input.txt, what this will do is it'll take the things I type in, standard in, and print them to standard out, which we're putting into input. The terminal is moving standard out into input.txt. Lots of content, super good, super high quality content. And if you give cat an actual file name, it'll print out what's in that file, which is this. Cool. Let's run it again. Excellent. We did not break the C laws. So looking back at our code, um, we print it out into some text. This is going to fit sideways, cool. Um, we made our array, 
we made our input file be input.txt rather than stidden like before. And we did our same f gets as before, but rather than stidden, we used input file. So whenever you see stidden, you can also use a file that you make it scan in yourself. Does that make sense? Cool. Any thumbs up from anybody who has feeling like this has made sense? Literally nobody. OK, a couple of you. Thank you for paying attention. Um, but I want, whoa, I want to move on to something else that's really cool. So let's do that. So let's talk about memory. You might remember, ha ha ha, that Jushang talked about memory yesterday. I'm going to say some more things about memory. So the memory, like when I say memory, I refer to the memory of our program, which is all of the things that are in memory for our program, I guess. Um, if you're familiar with like how computers work, if you're not familiar with how computers work, uh, you have like a hard drive that stores files. You have RAM, which stores memory. And so files like live forever. And memory is like a brief thing that it'll have whatever you put there, but it won't store it forever. So memory is really fast to access. And that's why our programs put things in memory. The memory for our program is basically a really big array. It's basically a four gigabyte size array. And so the program has this four gigabyte array that it can access in memory or that it thinks it can access. Everything is good. And everything is stored in memory somewhere. So variables are stored in memory, surprisingly enough, when you go into i equals 0, i is somewhere in memory. The code for your program is also stored in memory. So when you make a function, when you make a main function, the code for that is in memory. Because otherwise, how will it run the code? It needs to be somewhere. Um, the code for library functions is in memory. So printf, scanf, and so on, they are in memory somewhere. The memory for your program. And since everything is stored in memory, like it's stored somewhere in memory, it has an address, there is a place in memory that we can point to and we can say that is where printf is, or that is where your function is, or that is where i is. Um, and it's similar to like a home address, right? I assume most, if not all of you, have a home address. I don't. It sucks when you're trying to get mail. Um, seriously, I don't have a street address. And they're like, you need a street address. And I'm like, I don't have one. Everything's terrible. Anyway, but it's like you have a home address, right? Like you might live at 2 George Street in Sydney. So we can go in Sydney to the place that is George Street and go to the house that's at number 2 George Street. That is your address. Um, this is exactly the same, but instead of Sydney, it's the memory in your program. Um, and because it's somewhere, it has an address. We can get the address, right? So we can use the ampersand, uh, the address of operator. And we tend to print memory addresses in hexadecimal. In terms of why, why do we do that, Andrew? What a good question. Why don't you wait a little bit and I'll tell you. Um, in terms of where things are stored in memory, different things are in different places. So like all of the variables are in one place, all of the whatever is in one place, and so on. Um, so variables, which you all know about well, ints, chars, arrays, strings, they're stored in a thing called the stack. Am I talking too fast? I'm sorry, I'm really excited. I love this stuff. Have you understood the things that I've said really fast so far? Is there anything that I should say again? OK, I'll just talk slower. Um, so variables, the things in your program, are stored on a thing called the stack. Um, dynamic memory, which I'll explain next week or whenever I'm allowed to talk about it, is stored on the heap. Um, oh, man, it looked so good. So I have two diagrams, depending on which one I can actually fit. They're both sort of similar. I'll put this one here. So memory, like, we can think of the way memory is laid out as just being in, like a giant rectangle, right? So we can think of this as the, the low addresses, like the 0, x, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Um, so like the lowest possible address. And then down the bottom, we have the highest possible address. And things are always in like a fixed position relative to each other. So there's always magic and libraries like printf and stuff at the very start of memory. Your program is just below that. The thing called the heap is below that, which is where dynamic variables go. What does it mean? Stay tuned. Um, the stack is towards the bottom, which is where your variables are stored. Then there's even more magic at the bottom. Um, and here is a different diagram that also worked, didn't work earlier. So I said it shouldn't say the bottom of memory. It should say like the low addresses. Bottom and top are like. Just your opinion, man. We'll get to that in a minute. So the very top of memory of the page, the very low numbers, 
there are dragons, don't go there, everything is bad. System libraries go next, and then your program code goes there. The heap grows downwards, so when it gets more things it has to add, it expands downwards. Um, the stack grows upwards, so as you have more variables in your functions, it goes upwards. And then more dragons at the bottom. Um, it's worth noting that some people draw memory upside down. Uh, it's def my way is definitely the right way, and they are definitely upside down. Andrew Taylor may try to convince you otherwise, but he is wrong. Objectively, this is the correct way to do it. Um, if you're in the CSE Suck Facebook group, I posted a poll a couple of years ago, maybe last year, to see which people thought which one was right. And I persuaded everybody that my way was right. So that's good. Um, the reason for this is because stacks grow upwards. I'll talk more about that in future weeks. But basically, pay attention to which way up the diagram is drawn. If the person has the zeros at the top, and the Fs down the bottom, then this means that they've drawn their memory this way. If at the top there are Fs and down the bottom there are zeros, then that means it's upside down. Um, and we're never gonna like assess you on which way up does memory go because clearly there's no right answer, but like this sort of thing would never be an, an exam. You don't have to freak out about the fact that like the two Andrews have very different beliefs. Cool. In terms of these, these are hexadecimal numbers. I don't know if we've talked about hexadecimal numbers before. We might not have. Hexadecimal is base 16. Decimal, like normal numbers, is base 10. So base 10 means like one digit can store 10 things, 0, 1, 2, 3, through to 9, 10 different things. Hexadecimal means one digit can store 16 things, so 0 to 9 and then A to F. The convenient thing about hexadecimal is that if we have eight hexadecimal digits, we can store all of the possible memory addresses, all the way from zero through to all Fs. And so this is the range of possible memory addresses. And so we use these because they fit nicely. They're always eight characters. Cool, memory. Let's lay that in a certain way. Everything is good. So next up, references. Dushank also talked about this with you, I think. So the lecture video claims. So I said we can get the address with ampersand, the address of symbol. And so if we have a number called 10, called number, value 10, uh, the address of number is percent %p, ampersand number. So when I put the ampersand in front of the number, I'm saying tell me the address of number, tell me where number lives in memory. And you always use percent %p to print out addresses, just because. And so we might call this a reference. So ampersand number is a reference to the variable number. It's the address at which you can find the variable number. I'm going to go through some stereo stuff here, and then we're going to look at actual coding this stuff. And so it'll make sense either this time or the coding time or next week or sometime. So just bear with me. Um, when we have the address, we know how to get to something. Like if I know your street address, I know how to turn it up to your head. I know how to turn up at your house and find you if you're at your house, right? But that's weird. But in computers, it's not weird, because you need to know where things are in memory. So if you have the address of a variable, or an array, or something, you really know how to get to it. So if we printed this out, did I have that? No. Printed out the address of the number is percent %p. It might give us something like the address of the number is 0xffd53f50. So when I ran it on CSE earlier, that was the address of the variable number in my program. Um, when we have the address, we know how to get to it. And we use like the star operator, or the, the dereference operator to get to it. So a dereference is like we take the reference and we like de it. We, go to the, we undo the reference and we go to the place that it has the value for. If you're confused, that's fine. So if the address of number is this number here, we can get to the value at that address by putting a star in front by using the dereference thing. So if we dereference a reference, we get the original thing. So if we had printf, the value at address percent %p is percent %d, so print out this pointer and this number. The value at address, this address, is dereference this address, go to the address, find the value that's there, and then print that out. So that should print out the value at address percent %p is 10. Um, I'll draw some pictures soon. We can do this directly in the printf. If we wanted to, we could get the address of number, the reference to it, and then we could do the star on it. So we could put the star on the ampersand on the number, which basically achieves nothing. It just gets the reference and then dereferences it straight away. Why would you do that? For a lecture example. Um, 
That's the same as that one, isn't it? Yeah, I must not have deleted that one. Cool. But Andrew, why would we do that when we can just print out the number directly? Yeah, exactly. But the reason addresses are useful is for telling other things, things far away, like other functions about the address of something in your function. Like, if I'm in a function and I have something and it's in my function and you don't know where it is, you can't do anything with it. But if I tell you, hey, I've got this great array over here at this address here, you can go from your function, look at the array at the address I've told you, and then do things to my array. Um, and in order to store things, we need a way to store them, right? So we have a special type for storing addresses, which has this star, like the dereference symbol in front of it. So we can say int star, uh, int number is 10, so we have a variable called number, contains the value 10. Uh, int star, number address, is equal to the address of number. So we have this variable called number address of type int star that is equal to the address of number. So I could print out the address of number is this, um, I could print out the value at that is this from before the address and then dereferencing the address. Um, but I can also dereference it directly here. So the value at this address is this value. You're probably confused. That's okay. Um, and we call these pointers because they point to the thing that they're storing. Uh, so the syntax for a pointer, um, you have the type that it's pointing to, the star, the name of the pointer equals ampersand something. So int star means a pointer to an int. The name of the pointer is my pointer, and it is equal to the address of my variable. And so the value of the pointer is the address of the thing that it points to. So if you are at seat number 10, let's say, you're at seat number 10, so your address is seat 10. And if I am appointed to you, my value is C10. I contain the value that you are over there. Um, who's confused? Who's not confused? That's awesome. Some of you aren't confused. Um, do you want me to draw diagrams first or write code first? Who votes diagrams first? Who votes code first? It's like split between the two halves of the room. Do I like the front half more or the back half more? Um, I reckon let's do both. Let's draw diagrams and also write code. <laughs> File new, save as references. Cool. References, Andrew Bennett. Cool, let's make ourselves a main function. Let's do some stuff. Here's the code in the main function. Everything is good. OK, and when I tried earlier, this worked just fine, which means it's going to break now because nothing could ever work consistently. That would be a horrible thing to happen. Oh my god, it worked. It's crazy. OK. So let's make the brightness go higher so we can see it. Yeah, cool, good start. So let's start out with a really super basic function. Uh, if I move that one over there and that one there, cool, this works. So if I have a super basic function, uh, int basic function, Let's just give it nothing void. Int number equals 10. Cool. And so in my super basic function down here, all I have is one int called number, and it contains the value 10. So here is my basic function. Um, is that a good size and a good neatness of handwriting to read? Can anybody not read that? Cool. And so inside my basic function, I have one int down here. Contains the value 10, and it's called number. Let's have another int. Int another, no, it's too long. Int num1 equals 20. And so now I've made another variable. It's also an int. 
size of it is one int. It's called num1. Its value is 20. And so this here, this box, is an overly simplified diagram of the memory of this function. So when this function runs, this will be the memory of that function. This is the stuff that it can access. Let's give it some addresses, 0x101, 0x102. So this is address, the, the variable number is at address 0x101, and the variable num1 is at address 0x102. The numbers have to be different because they're different things. Everything is good. So if I wanted to expand my function, I am going to need a bigger box. So let's make, actually, first of all, let's go printf the address of number is percent p. and address of num1. Num1 is address of num1. Cool, so then I'm going to run this code with my imaginary magical compiler, right? And this is going to print out address of number is 0x101, and address of num1 is 0x102 because we can see in address, when we have the variable number here, it's stored in address 101, and the variable num1 here is stored in address 102. Is this all good so far? Cool, so now I'm gonna make a new variable, uh, int star. Uh, hello, equals the address of number. And so what I've done here, I've made myself a new variable, it's called hello, uh, this diagram is not to scale, by the way. And it contains the address of number. So its value is going to be this highlighter address here of number here. I didn't hit record first. I'm going to hit record now. I'm sorry, people who did not see this recorded. That's OK. I'll make it up later on. So this. variable number is at address 101. So when I say int star hello equals the address of number, I've got a variable called hello of type int star, of type thing that holds address of number, equals the address of number. So what number do I write in here, in this box here? If it contains the address of number, what's that going to be? Someone said zero, cool, good start. Zero, what's next? X, cool, what's next? 101, very good. So the variable I have called hello, it's at an address itself because it exists, it is equal to the address of number. And so you can sort of think about this like this one here is this one here. And star. Hello equals the address of number. Cool, and that's like saying that int star hello equals 0x101 because that is the address there. Cool, does that make sense so far? What questions do you have so far? Yes. Cool, why do I have the star on hello over here? Cool. That is because this, the type of this variable is a pointer to an int, or it's a thing that holds the address of an int. So the type of a normal int is just int, int are ints. But to make something that points to an int, I need to have the star in the name, or in the type. So int star here is the type that it is, and then the name follows. Make sense? Cool. Any other questions? Yes, if I had a, the address of a character, I would have char star. 
But Andrew, isn't that how we talk about strings? What a good question. Uh, and again, a, 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 the, something that stores the address of a double would be double star name. Cool. People who were confused before, are you less confused? Any amount of less confused? OK, a few of you. Are you less confused or do you have questions? You're less confused. Excellent. Those of you who are still confused, which part confuses you? All of it? Because I didn't have the correct thing in my slides. Sorry, I tried to move that off the screen. Cool, good question. Any other questions? Yes. Is there a way that you can set the address of a variable to itself? So is there a way that I can tell the computer where to store a variable myself? No, I can't. Because C goes, this variable is going to go right here. No choice about it. Um, yeah, that's basically the answer to the question. I could make a variable that holds some arbitrary address that wasn't necessarily an address of one of our things, but that would crash. Cool. Any other questions? OK, shall we run this code and see what happens? Let's comment out all of this stuff. OK, so main here it does nothing. Basic function. What's the keyboard shortcut for delete the thing you just typed in gedit? Because I keep hitting it rather than save. Let's do that. Function prototype. Didn't forget it this time. Yay. OK, DCC dash O. References. References dot C. By the way, a pro tip, always store your code in a file called dot C. The reason for this is DCC won't overwrite stuff in a file called blah.c. If you've called your C file just blah by itself with no .c on the end, DCC won't know that it's a code file, and so it'll let you overwrite it. And then you'll lose your assignment, and then it will be really annoying because you have to do your assignment again. Incidentally, that's a really good reason. So for the assignment, we told you that you had to submit via give every time you did any work on the assignment. How many of you actually did that? Oh, OK, more than I expected. But then again, like half of you didn't raise your hands. One of the advantages to doing this is that if you lose your code, we have your code. If you write your assignment, you submit your progress so far, your computer catches fire, you can get your code back, although you might not care because your computer's caught fire, you have bigger problems. But um, if for some reason you lose your code, we have a copy of it that you can get. So please do submit your code as you go. Super good idea. Why did I say that? All right. Don't call your thing without dot .c on the end, because that will also. Uh, I forgot my hash includes. Hash includes. Listed.io.h. Cool. So looking at this program, main calls basic function and does literally nothing else. I'll move that down there. So main is basically doing nothing, and basic function is the thing that's happening. I'll put it return 0 there. And so basic function, then, is the thing where stuff happens. Inside, we make a number with a value 10, and number num1 with a value 20. We make hello be the address of number. We print out the address of number and the address of number 1. Cool. So this should print out two addresses. And indeed, it is printed out to addresses. So in this case, the address of number happened to be 0xff837ffo, and num1 happened to be da 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 o o. So if I run it again, the addresses change. It's kind of weird. Any idea why that happens? They're always like 10 off from each other, though. Let me add some spaces. 
that should be enough. There we go. So we can see these numbers are always 10 or hexadecimal 10 off from each other. So this one is 50, this one is 60. This one is FO, FFO, and so on. So if you're sitting there bored, why don't you try and find out why the addresses keep changing? And if you're not, do you remember the command to do the thing? No, I asked you before. OK, I'll see if I can Google it really quickly. Oh, computer. Mm. Watch. There's totally a way to do this. Ah, oh, because when you put a dash in Google, it doesn't search for it. There we go. That one there, okay. So now if I run my program, which is called references, they're always in the same place. Awesome, that is nice and convenient for our code. Cool, so I know the address of number and the address of num1. So I can do this, int star uh, number. I can make this be equal to the value that is the address of num1. And so what I've done here is I've made myself a variable called adder num1. Adder num1. And it is a box in my function that contains the number f, 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 f. B twenty. Um, and so then I know that num one was at that address there. Cool. So when I do this here, this will mean that I now have a variable called address num one that contains the address of num one. Um, do you remember what I said before about how we can actually dereference something and get to the value inside of it? You probably don't because I said it very briefly. So to get the address of something, I use an ampersand. To go to the address that I have, I use a star. So the ampersand, like ampersand and star are sort of opposites to each other. References, references.c. Hmm. You know what, I'm going to use GCC because it's less complaining. Ah. Why does that not work? Oh, it's a warning, I can ignore it. All the best people ignore warnings in their code. Oh man, okay. Oh, they moved. What? What's happened here? The numbers have changed. Any idea what might have happened there? If I comment out this one that I've just made, they're back to the same values as before. But then when I uncomment out this one here, I see. GCC did things differently. So I've printed out the address of num number with ampersand address and address. I've printed out the address of num1 with and num1 down here. I have made a variable of type int star so that will hold the address of an int called adder num1 to be equal to this number here, which I happen to know is the address of num1. I've then said the value is percent d and number 
by saying star address num1, which means take the address that is in address num1, go to that address, and then print that out in this case. Cool. Who's still confused? Do you have a question or are you? Right, how did I stop the address from changing each time I ran it? You tell me. It's a secret. I ran a secret magical command which made the addresses stop changing each time. Um, I'm happy to talk about it more after the lecture if you like, or I can give you annoying hints and not tell you the answer after the lecture and you'll get sad. The important thing there is that when you run it on your computer normally, it will do that. And if you do magic, it will stop doing that. Cool. So let's look at some arrays. Arrays are exciting. Arrays are cool. Cool, arrays are cool. Void function takes in no input, does nothing. Excellent. So in my arrays are cool function, I'm going to make myself an array. And I'm going to call it array because I've got good taste in names. Um, I'll make it be size 10. Um, and I'll initialize it to all zeros. Cool, what should I do with my array now? Maybe I'll, I know it's 10 big, so I'll just go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Cool. So this will put the values 0 through to 9 into my array in each slot. So just to prove it, array slot 3 should be equal to 4. No, oh, that still worked despite that, didn't it? Oh yeah, three. So in array slot number three, I have the value three. Zero, one, two, three. Cool. So do you remember what I said ages ago when I first talked about arrays? Arrays are like a whole bunch of boxes glued together. So an array is like an int and another int and another int and another int, sort of all smushed together. So to prove that to you, let's look at the addresses of the array. Um, the address of the array, the address of array is percent %p for address and percent array. So this should print me out the address of the variable array, which is an array of ints. Cool, so the address of array is this number here. But what I want to know, what's the address of array one? What's the address of all of the arrays? Array 1, array 2, array 3. So this should print me out the address of array element 1 and address of array element 2. Uh, DCC, clear. Oh, did it actually not compile that time because I had an error? I didn't save it, yes, thank you. Thank you. Clear references. Cool, and so we can see, oh, I didn't print out the words. The address of array in our first printf is D0. The address of array one is D4. The address of array two is D8. So you can see that each of the array elements are stored next to each other in memory. The address of one of them is like the address of the other one plus a little bit and so on. Does that make sense? Arrays are just things glued together. Cool. Are there any questions? Let me check if I had anything else cool I wanted to talk about. Uh, where are my slides? Okay. So are there any questions? And if not, I'll show you a really cool thing, and then we can go home. Yes? Hang on. Shh. Mm -hmm. 
Um, what a good question. Is the address of array the same as the address of array zero? Um, I'll put these in here. So I'll print out the address of array and then the address of array zero, then the address of array one and address of array two and so on. ECC, clear. Cool, so we can see the address of array and the address of array zero are the same thing. So what this means is that array is at the same place as array zero. Kind of confusing. The reason for this is a really cool and sneaky thing. So first of all, I'll get rid of that so it doesn't complain at me. When we talk about an array, right, we talk about printf array percent d new line array 3. Right, so this is going to print out the element in position 3, so the fourth element of the array. Is everybody cool with this? We're happy with arrays. Arrays print things out. We go array brackets number and it prints the thing out. Cool. So what will this code do? Three brackets array. So what will this code do? I put the three at index array rather than array at index three. Who thinks it's gonna like be an error or not compile or be like, what are you doing, Andrew, you're crazy? Okay, who thinks it'll compile but do something weird and not work? Who has another idea of what it might do? Who thinks it'll just do the same thing as the line above? That's what my vote's for. Let's run this and see. So when I print out array square brackets three, it prints out three, the value in there. And when I print out three square brackets array, it prints out three, the value in there. Is that like weird? Is that cool? I'm, I reckon that's pretty cool. So why does this happen? Does anyone have any idea of why this might be happening? Probably not, because C is weird and crazy and confusing, right? And no one knows what's going on. Uh, thinking back to the question of why is array and array zero, the address of them, the same place? Uh, I'm going to let you in on a secret that you should then never use again. Um, address of array zero. Let me just try that again here. So the address, address of array zero is the same as the address of array plus zero. No, I don't. Yes, do. do I? Yes. Why? Who raised a pointer? Uh, One of the tutors says I need to dereference it first. I think I don't. Let's see who's right. Yes, the tutor is right. Because what I actually meant to say no, I'm not, trust me. So when I say array zero here, I mean the same as go to array plus zero and then dereference that. Um, and so then array one is the same as saying go to array plus one and dereference that. Like go to this address and get the value from it. And so what is it, what is it when I say uh, three brackets array? What's that doing? What should it be in here? Three plus array. And because maths addition is the same on both sides. Anyway, that's crazy and cool and I think it's quite awesome and also quite weird. In general, you should never have, we call this pointer arithmetic, you should never do this, this is bad. This is banned in the style guide and it's banned for a reason. And the reason is because things can go very, very, very wrong. But that's a cool, interesting fact and this is really awesome. Are there any questions before we pack up? Yes. That 
would take too long to answer. Cool. Any more questions? OK, well, farewell, oh, wonderful students. I will see you next week. If you have any questions, I'll be around for a bit. Otherwise, enjoy your treats and labs. Go to your labs, do the test, all those good things. If you, haven't done the, if you haven't handed in the assignment, you can still hand it in and pass if you do it tonight. Cool, OK. Hello, let me just start backing up. <laughs>